Good evening, and welcome to the Center for Geopolitics at Cambridge University. I'm Brendan Sims, the director of the Center. The Center for Geopolitics seeks to deepen the study of grand strategy and statecraft at the University of Cambridge. Our guest tonight is Tim Marshall. He is the author of several best-selling books, including Prisoners of Geography, 10 Maps That Tell You Everything You Need to Know About Global Politics, and Divided, Why We're Living in an Age of Walls. Tim has decades of experience in international affairs. He was diplomatic editor at Sky News and has reported from 40 countries. Tim Marshall has done more than most to make geopolitics accessible to a wider audience through his books. After Tim's very successful lecture about borders a few years ago, he now returns to the Center for Geopolitics to speak to his new book on the power of geography, 10 maps that reveal the future of our world. Now, before I give the floor to Tim, I'd like to remind you of the format of this event. Tim will speak for 25 to 30 minutes or so, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of discussion with me. Then we will come to questions from you, our truly global audience. We have more than 300 viewers signed up from at least four continents. If you have questions that you would like to put to Tim Marshall, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit them. Please give your name and affiliation if you have one. You can submit questions at any point throughout the event. As always, this event is being recorded and will be made available on our website in the coming days. Tim Marshall, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, thank you to the Center for the invitation. Thanks for that lovely uh, introduction as well. I uh, do admit to having a little bit of book envy uh, going on there in the background. And uh, such a shame that, that we, we, we can't all be together uh, in Cambridge, but I, I hope someday we can uh, rectify that. Uh, the book, the new book, uh, the basis of it um, is that geography doesn't really change that much. And some of the players in it on the stage, that, sure, they change. But the geography remains the same. And if you understand the geography of nations, it's so uh, much part of understanding its history and its current affairs. And I'd go as far as to argue, if you don't understand the terrain of the country, you're not gonna have a full grasp uh, of, of why the country behaves as it does. And I think you're also uh, not gonna be able to predict with accuracy. I mean, we're always guessing when we're predicting, but you can make better, better educated guesses when you, you know more about the geography which is one and only one of the determining factors is what happens. So to set it up, um, there's now uh, 193 countries, more or less, in, in the world, more than there's ever been. And when you look around the map of, of, of this world and you see all these countries and you realize that to an extent they're gonna be divided into factions. Well, my generation uh, grew up in the Cold War, in the bipolar world of the Cold War. And the bipolar world was relatively easy to understand um, because you realize that a lot of the events that happened played into what was going on between the two superpowers. At the end of the Cold War, there was then this brief unipolar moment. The French call it the hyperpuissance, the hyperpower moment of, of American uh, pretty much unchallenged uh, authority. Sorry, we're just um, going through the, uh, the, the slides. Um, as I said, 193, yeah, bipolar world. And then moving on, we have this unipolar moment. Now I've put the, those dates there because of the fall of communism and the financial crash when America began to withdraw somewhat into its periods of isolationism that it goes through. But you know, th those dates are movable a little bit, I think. But I think it's clear we're several years now into the multipolar world. And in the multipolar world, a number of things are happening. The second tier powers are jostling for position. And I'm arguing that the jostling for position ahead of what is likely to be a new form of Cold War, a new bipolar world. Now, I have to use shorthand, A, because of the time constraints, 
but also because it's the future. We don't know exactly what shape the Cold War, if it happens, will take. Uh, I mean, it won't be exactly like the previous one because the ideology, the, the, the clash there of ideologies will not be as present at all. In that interim period, um, I think a lot of countries are using the space now of not having a world policeman in order to say that we are the law in our area. The problem with that is that their neighbors might think, no, you're not. And that's why one of the many reasons it's a turbulent time. Other countries, and this has happened, it's happening faster than I thought it would, are already making, uh, nailing their colors to the flag. And the British and Australians are pretty good uh, examples of that. And I'll come back to that. Turkey, I think, is a good example of a country that's using this interim period when America's attention is not focused and when we haven't got the discipline of the bipolar world. And then also for context, I'd like to show you a United Nations video of the movement of uh, refugees and migrants this century. Every orange dot, 17 migrants and or refugees. And you'll know that not overwhelmingly, but a majority of this movement is from the south and towards the north. And it's pretty obvious what is driving it, Confl uh, conflict. If you look at Latin America there, places like Venezuela and uh, Colombia. If you look into Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, the Central African Republics. And as you move through the timeline at the bottom of the screen, in a couple of years, we get to the Arab uprisings. And of course, there's a huge movement of peoples. So conflict is driving this, poverty is driving this, and to an extent, climate change is driving this. And I don't think these numbers have peaked. Uh, there is an aberration you'll see in a moment uh, in Ukraine, uh, when there's 400,000 Ukrainian Russian speakers who uh, move into Russia itself, but that is an aberration. So that is the context, the interim period between two bipolar moments and the space in which to try to gain what you can, or the time in which you're thinking, I'm going to have to make decisions about which sides to join. And I'm going to go back to my um, a previous book now in the next slide with the best example I have of why and how geography is such a determining factor. If we move to Russia, I don't write much about Russia in the new book, but I think it's useful to set it up for anyone that isn't familiar with the argument. We look at Russia, we see the Arctic Ocean. We know that some of their ports freeze uh, some of the year. They have to go through the ice pack to get to the sea lanes of the world. If you look in front of the Ural Mountains, it's flat ground. It's flat ground all the way through the North European plain, all the way to the English Channel. And if we look at where the Baltic Sea is, and then move down through Poland, you'll find the Carpathian Mountains. Right, let's just hold that one there. The Carpathian Mountains. Now that gap there is the narrowest point of the North European plain. And it's through that gap that Russia has been invaded time and again by Poland, uh, by Sweden, by the Lithuanian Empire, by the French in 1812, all the way to the gates of uh, Moscow, by the Germans in 1914, and by the Germans again in 1941. So ask yourself what that does to the Russian psyche. Uh, what it does is that the Russian foreign policy looking westwards will always be to dominate that flat ground in front of them, to try to have a buffer of Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states. And if they can achieve it, even to have dominance over that gap, Poland, and that's why Poland disappears off the map every now and again through the centuries. It's also why Poland uh, has it, its own foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So if you look a bit closer now and look down at the Black Sea, and remember the frozen ports, that's their only warm water port. It's not even theirs, Sebastopol in Crimea. And when Ukraine flipped into the Western sphere of influence, the Russians, they had a choice, you could argue, but uh, it wasn't much of a choice. They feared that because they were only leasing that port, that the Ukrainians might take it away from them. And they acted, they took it. Now, again, from the Russian perspective, and it's very important to, when you're trying to understand a country, to look at it from inside that country, outwards. Don't look at the country, look outwards from the country. Well, if they want to leave the Black Sea and get out into the sea worlds, they've got to go through the Bosphorus, and it's only a mile wide. So, and Turkey's in charge. So move on to the next slide and we'll see it from the European perspective. 
if they get out of the Black Sea, and it's a time of great tension or conflict, that's not a given. Look at all those NATO countries they have to go past, not just Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey, but then Greece, and then Italy, where there's a US naval base, and then France, Spain, Portugal, and Britain, and Gibraltar. And only then are they in the great sea lanes of the world. Baltic Sea, similar story, past lots of NATO powers. Come out of the Arctic Ocean, you've still got to go through what's called the GI-UK gap, Greenland, Iceland, UK. So that is a serious determining factor in how Russia behaves and how it will behave in the future. When you predict things, you will get things wrong. But if you have this sort of geographic knowledge, uh, as well as your political and historical knowledge, I think you're better equipped. So um, back up to the modern world and to Greece and Turkey, for example. I'm going to have to obviously broad brush because of time constraints. Again, these things tell you a lot. They tell you that Greece, despite being quite a large country, cannot sustain a large population. Look at that mountainous area and look at the areas you can grow crops on. Very limited. Therefore, they have always looked to the sea. And that is why that dotted line you see to halfway through the map means that the Aegean is pretty much a Greek lake. And Turkey is not particularly happy about that and hasn't been for the best part of a century. Go a bit closer into Turkey. And you'll see uh, they are relatively secure. They've locked the back door of the mountains to their east. They control the high ground of the Anatolian plain, which means that the really rich, fertile areas around the coastline and around Istanbul, uh, they're safe and they could actually start expanding out. They went up the Maritza River Valley all the way to um, Vienna. Again, look at that dotted line. It's not good enough if you're Turkish. So look at Turkey at, well, the Ottoman Empire, I should say, at its height. And bear in mind in this next slide that it's only 100 years since that empire disappeared. And 100 years, as Professor Sims knows, is the blink of an eye in the collective consciousness of a nation. And then look at what Turkey is now. It's lost a lot. I mean, people say that the British have never got over losing their empire. I'm, I'm not sure that's true. I think there is a lingering uh, idea of it. But I think it's the same in, in Turkey. And I think it's more than lingering. So go to the last slide on Turkey, and we see two things. One is the blue homeland concept, which has lain dormant in Turkey for almost a century. This is the territory, uh, the near territory that they lost when the Ottoman Empire collapsed and the treaties of the 1920s came into force. And when you read the Turkish military manuals now, blue homeland is everywhere. Um, and they mean to have part of that back. And of course, this is what I mean about this interim period. They couldn't have done anything about this in the Cold War. Now that there is no world policeman, they are beginning to push it out again, including into the EEZs. The line there on the black on the left is the, e, uh, is the border with Greece. They found oil and gas in Greek waters and Cypriot waters, and Turkey is not prepared to accept it. They go not by the UN's EEZs, they argue the continental shelf argument. And they say, therefore, that shaded territory is theirs to explore. And that's why there's this massive tension uh, between Greece and Turkey at the moment. You may have noticed Last week, President Biden used the G word, genocide. The first American president in almost 50 years to call what happened to the Armenians genocide. Why did he do that? He did it because in this interim period, Turkey under Erdogan has been behaving in a manner that the Americans believe a NATO member should not behave. Notably, buying the Russian S-400 missile defense system. Can you imagine a NATO power buying its missile defense system from Russia during the Cold War in the bipolar world? Absolutely not. And that's the best example I have, and there are so many around the globe, of a country using this interim period to push out, because in the coming years, there may be increased pressure to rein yourself in. And I think Biden has just fired the first shot by calling it genocide. Uh, moving on very briefly to Iran. Um, the Americans, I don't believe, knew what they were doing when they invaded Iraq from this perspective. 
militarily they knew that what they were doing. I don't think they knew that they were delivering to the Iranians a 3000 year old dream to safeguard their Western flank. For 3000 years, the Persians had been worried about incursions coming from Mesopotamia. They pushed out into Mesopotamia periodically to try to safeguard that flank. And the Americans delivered it because Saddam was a Sunni Muslim who persecuted the Shia Muslims of Iraq. Iran is a Shia country. Now, with him gone, it's a Shia-dominated government in Iraq. Much, much more friendly to Iran. There is no threat now to Iran from Iraq. And Iran is playing heavily in Iraq. So now you can connect Tehran to Baghdad. Pull out a bit and look at the Middle East. And next door is Syria, ruled by the Assad clan who, as Alawites, are an offshoot of Shia Islam, which is why Iran has always had good relations with them, and it's why Iran is now fighting in Syria to save the Assad regime in Damascus. That's my third capital city. Head next door to Lebanon, Beirut, and who funds arms and trains? Hezbollah, the Shia militia, which is the strongest military force in Lebanon. Iran, that is their corridor to the Mediterranean. That explains why they're fighting in Syria. That explains why all the countries around them are trying to break that chain. To Australia. And this is my example of a country making its choices ahead of the possible bipolar world. I mean, look where it is. Look to its left and its right and its south. Not a great deal going on. Briefly, a brief aside, New Zealand. Now it's about two and a half thousand, three thousand miles from Australia, but it, you know we kind of link them together. New Zealand did something very interesting last uh, recently. There's the Five Eyes intelligence sharing network of Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and um, uh, the USA. And they wanted to put out a joint statement about the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs. Four of them said yes, and one of them said no. And I think in very broad brush terms, a look at the map explains why. In front of China is the first island chain. If they get past that, there's the second island chain. If they get past that, there's Australia. But what has New Zealand got in front of it? Australia. So New Zealand is increasing its trade with China at the moment and did not sign up to that declaration because it has got more time than Australia to hedge its bets. Australia is nailing its colors firmly to America. So moving a bit closer, just up there above Northern Territory and Queensland, Papua New Guinea, that's not too far. See the little islands to the right as we get into the Coral Sea and Pacific. And then there's what you can loosely call the second island chain, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Sumatra, etc. Then look at the size of Australia. And then I think it's only got a population of 25 million. You can't have a massive Navy capable of defending your sea routes and your supply routes. And remember they've only got, they don't have, uh, self-sustainability in energy or food. You better have a good friend. You better have a very, very good friend. Um, if we uh, look at a man on a horse next, there's a reason. This is another professor, Griffith Taylor. The first geography professor of Sydney University told the Australians in the 1920s, by 2000, this country can only sustain 20 million people. They weren't happy with him because they wanted a sea to shining sea American dream. America, 340 million people now. Australia, 25 million. And there's a reason for that. And that reason is water. If you look at the river system, this is what uh, Taylor looked at, and this is why Taylor made his uh, prediction, which came true. The river system in Australia is almost entirely in that little corner of Australian. And it's why from Brisbane, in the curve round to Adelaide, 85% of Australia's population lives there. And that's because that's where the water is. And if you look at Australia at night from satellite, you see it very, very starkly. He knew that before the world of satellites. The satellite world tells us it um, ext extremely starkly. So they can't have the population to sustain the Navy, to, to sustain the sea lanes. So they need a friend. And that brings us to John, uh, to, to again, their position in the world. Let's pull out again. Pull out again and think of 1941 and what Britain was doing, way up there on the top left corner. 
1941, Britain was a bit busy. I think there's something called the Battle of Britain going on and the Germans were on the coast of France. And then look above Australia at Papua New Guinea. The Japanese had invaded it. They bombed Darwin. Well, John Curtin, the uh, Australian Prime Minister at the time, made a choice. I would argue he didn't have a choice. I would argue he's a prisoner of geography. Let's put a quote up by Mr. Curtin in typical abrasive, and I think quite lovable, Aussie manner. He basically said, that's it. Sorry, UK, we, you know, we know you're not coming to help us. America, you're a Pacific power, we're a Pacific power. You're our new best friend. And within months of that statement, 150,000 American troops were in Australia. The Japanese had called off any idea of uh, invading it. And in the Battle of Coral Sea, um, that was the end of that. Pull out again, and you see why Australia is now in the quad. India, Australia, United States, and South Korea. This is a semi-formal naval agreement which, whose unstated aim is to box in China. And Australia looks across to America, looks at the future, looks at the first island chain, and it's made its decision. Last year, it um, came out very strongly and asked for an international inquiry into the COVID-19. Where did it come from? And Beijing went nuts, absolutely ballistic on this, diplomatically and economically. You'll know Australian wine, uh, a third of its export did go to China. Not anymore. They slapped 200% tariff on Australian wine. It's collapsed. Nobody is selling to China now. A third of their market went. And that's actually a very small part of, an, of their GDP. Th that's the headline grabber, because we all know Australian wine. But many of the other Australian products have fallen by as much. And that's really hurting their economy. They are not backing down. This week, I think, uh, a little bit contemptuously, uh, the Australian Interior Minister said he feared there could be a war with China within a few years. I, I don't think so. I don't even think there's going to be a war in Taiwan in the next few years. But it shows you that they're not backing down, and it shows you that they've made their decision ahead of having to be forced into decisions when it comes to security uh, in the coming bipolar world. They're sticking with the Americans. The Britons, I think, have made their choice. Uh, Britain, plucky little Britain, I should say, with its brand new aircraft carrier, is sailing it to the South China Sea next month. Not because American needs are one new aircraft carrier. They have 11 of their own. Not because the Chinese will be quaking in their boots, but because we're making a statement of intent. And we're saying, don't worry, America, we've got your back. It could be the other way around, but that's what we're saying. Uh, and like Australia, we are saying to Huawei, the phone company, not in our 5G system. This is happening faster than I thought it would. I think COVID has been an accelerator of many things. Uh, and that is one of them. But we do need to look at it from China's perspective, looking back out. And I think you might agree as a great world power, if you look out from their perspective, back out at the world, you'll see what's in front of them. If you see China's perspective, what they see in front of them is a wall. If we move on to the next slide, you'll see that wall. And that wall is made up of American allies, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Philippines, Malaysia, the Malacca Strait with Singapore and an American base. That's a wall as far as the Chinese are concerned. And why shouldn't they push out past it? Why shouldn't they safeguard their sea lanes? Now, it's a different argument about whether they should own the whole of the South China Sea, which I believe they intend to try and do, even though there are other countries that have claims on the Spratly Islands and the Paracel Islands, etc. But from their perspective, I think it's entirely understandable. Right, uh, briefly in uh, five minutes to go, a quick bit of fun, I hope. Uh, and I hope it is fun and doesn't turn too serious. Space. I've written a chapter in the new book about space because I think we don't look at space, um, if you can move back to it as a previous slide, as uh, ge geography. Firstly, there's the geography of who can actually get to space. These are the countries that have launch capacity and they are very limited. And there's three big players, Russia, China, the USA. Come back to Earth and look at the world's choke points. There's a reason I'm showing the choke points, which we're all familiar with. 
And that is because uh, I'm arguing that there are similar choke points in space because there's a geography to space. If we look at the low earth orbit, what is not on the next map is not it is the low earth orbit and the others, but what we don't see uh, in the next slide is uh, things like the Van Allen belt, the radiation belt, which some countries would say, we're happy for you to go and explore the radiation belt, given you can't survive there. Move on to the next slide. Um, and we're, we're quite happy for you to have bits that aren't a problem. But space has its own geography. It has its regions where the gravity is stronger. It has its geostationary orbits where you can hang a space station there without needing fuel to just to keep it in position because the gravity is cancelling the gravities are cancelling each other out we have the van uh, the radiation belt and we have low earth orbit and this is my best example i'm not saying that any one power is going to control the low earth orbit but i'm saying that just as on earth you always put your foreign policy for what other countries might do or have the capacity to do. It is the same in space. If you control low Earth orbit, you control the satellites. And the satellites control pretty much everything on Earth now that is in the modern world, whether it's your supermarket delivery or your uh, radar defense system or your launch capability or your ability to see where your opponent's military is moving or the ability to see where cargo is doing, etc. That's coming from low Earth orbit. And if you control that, you can control Earth. That's why war, uh, space is now a war fighting domain, unfortunately, according to the major powers that have now uh, space um, operations within their military. Another one, uh, liberation zones, L1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. These are also areas which you can control them. Uh, you can control a lot. L2, the, Fre the French, the Chinese have put a satellite there. It looks back at the far side of the moon because that's where they intend to put a lunar base in the next few years. Britain has signed the Artemis Accords. A lot of the uh, democracies are in the Artemis Accords. They have agreed spheres of influence on the moon, but they haven't included Russia and China. So why on earth should Russia and China be uh, constrained by the Artemis Accords and the spheres of influence not to land, get their picks out and start digging? And our treaties, such as they are, are about 50 years out of date, 50 years behind the technology that we, 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 we currently have. So we need to get them up to date. Let's look back at Earth, because I think we are going to say goodbye to it. Um, sorry, those of you who are geopoliticians or, or, or theorists know about Mackinda <clears throat> and his heartland theory. Dolman is one of the doyens of the new astropolitics theorists. And he believes if you control Earth space, you control terror and you control the destiny of humankind. By the way, that low Earth orbit is also where you're going to refuel spaceships soon. And if you can ref if you control who can refuel spaceships for long distance travel, you control who can go to space. Now it doesn't have to be like this. You know, we can do this through cooperation. And Star Trek is the, is a great example. Um, let's look back at Earth. As I said, I do believe we're going to be leaving it. I do believe that the pale blue dot is our launch pad to our future. If we get lost, there is a map back home. Uh, this hopefully is the fun bit. Carl Sagan helped design it. Uh, and the map shows what some humans look like. It shows that they have movement of their limbs. Um, my joke in the book is that this is the internationally agreed sign of greeting. My worry is it's the intergalactically agreed sign of we're coming to kill you, uh, in which case we'd be in a spot of trouble because on the map there to the left, that shows our solar system and how to get back to the sun and then how to get back to our planet. And again, I think I say in the book that if they're vegetarians, if they're not vegetarians, we could be in a spot of trouble, which is why the great philosopher Homer uh, may have got it right again, but I hope not. Uh, and, I, and I hope that the end is not near. The end of the talk is uh, just about. So I'll leave you with two slides briefly. One is just looking at our future and also saying that because I think we're going out there and we have the ingenuity to do it, there is so much tech that's going on now that is going to help us here. One is mining asteroids. There's one we already know of that has more rare earth minerals than the GDP of the United States of America. And we can get to it and we can dig it out and we can share it without despoiling 
the planet. There's a lot of very, very positive things. And the reason I'm positive is that we have people in our generation now who are doing things and will think of things that will help us. One of them is microchip sized spaceships with sails that will unfurl because they'll be uh, printed in space in 3D. We're working on them hard a bit, that's the laser, to fire at them, to fire them at speeds to get to the nearest star, not the sun, within 20 years, not 20,000 years. Think what we will discover. And the reason I think it will happen is because Kepler worked it out 400 years ago. Obviously, he didn't know the tech, but he had that human ingenuity. And that's why I think for all these issues that I've scared everybody with up to a point for the past 30 three minutes. Sorry, Professor Sims. Um, I do believe we'll overcome them. I think the future is bright. Professor. Thank you very much, Tim, for that tour d'horizon uh, in multiple dimensions. Uh, in <laughs> um, the questions are beginning uh, to come in quite quickly. Um, I'm going to begin with a few of my own. Um, the first one is, is, is a general one, really, and it's about I think it brings your two, two worlds together um, in the sense that uh, you're obviously a reporter who's visited um, all or almost all of the places that you've Except space. <laughs> Except space. I'm working on it. Uh, I was going to ask you about that. Um, <laughs> but my question, and this comes from a very sedentary academic who spends his life uh, sitting in a room looking at maps. What is it that being there in person, which you've been mm. in, in most instances, what does that bring to the story that the maps uh, alone won't tell you? Um, it does bring another dimension. Um, I, I would hasten to add, um, and I'm not being humble here, this is true, I'm not an academic and I, therefore I don't have that depth of knowledge and expertise that, that people uh, like yourself have, Professor. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't go deep into first sources uh, you know, of, of the map that a certain general was spread out uh, on his table in 1941 and making decisions. And then, I mean, I don't do that. I'm not capable of doing it. And so, uh, you know, I can't bring that to the table. But, but what, what I can bring, I think, I think it's twofold, the experiences I had. One, uh, I, and I wish it was not like this, it's given me a, a fairly clear eyed view of international relations. You know, power does ultimately come from the power of a gun, um, even in democracies. Um, and so it brings a hard, perhaps, uh, edge to, to some of the writing. I mean, I try and uh, lighten it with very bad jokes. But the other one is colour. Um, you know, I am able to, to, to every now and again uh, bring in personal anecdotes. Um, Prisoners of Geography, for example, uh, I relayed why I never use the phrase mindless violence when it comes to geopolitics, because the violence is actually often mindful or logical. You know, I, I saw a village being burnt. I asked, why are you burning it? And they gave me the geographic answer. They wanted to clear the valley. They needed it for this reason. So, yeah, you, you can bring to it um, that. And I, 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 I think I have a, we all have a sell-by date. When I gave up um, full-time reporting and, and therefore a lot of the traveling, I, I realized I perhaps only had five, six, seven years. And then my anecdotes and experiences are beginning to get a little dusty. Um, there are fewer of them in, in, in this new book than there have been in the previous ones. And if I write another book, there'll be fewer still because you don't want to be that old guy banging on about, well, when I was in Bosnia, um, but I'm, I'm sorry, that's a very, that's quite a long answer, forgive me, but I, I think it brings some of the colour uh, of the events to the page. Thank you. Now, in the Prisoners of Geography book, you began with Russia, um, and it was in the immediate aftermath of the uh, annexation of the Crimea and then the, the war that uh, Putin began in, in, in eastern uh, Ukraine. Um, and uh, the PRC did feature obviously in that book, but it's absolutely the connecting thread really through this present book. Um, and you mentioned it also several times uh, in your talk, even areas that, that aren't uh, directly uh, adjacent to the PRC. Um, so my question here would be, um, how much of the destiny of the PRC 
is geography? And how much do you think is history and ideology? In other words, are they prisoners? Are they fated to act in the aggressive way? The PRC as, yeah. a, as a country? Yes. Yeah. I, mean, I don't um, yes, think... Um, well, they prisoners. are prisoners because, because um, from their perspective, they have to control the high ground where the water is. That's Tibet. They felt they had no choice. Um, I mean, you know, this, this is the problem with this clear-eyed view. You can, I mean, you can make a, an argument that the Tibetans should be free to choose what they do, um, but that's not going to change anything. It's not going to change the fact that all the water that China needs for its industry comes out of the Tibetan water tower, and that's why they're not going to let it go. So, that, so the Chinese are a prisoner in, in that sense, yes. They are a prisoner in that the Han Chinese, which is the 85 to 90 percent of them, are in the heartland in the center of it, and therefore they've built a buffer around them to protect them. They are prisoners in that um, it was double cropping that allowed them to build this massive, in the, in the early days, and we're going back centuries now, massive population. And now they're prisoners of it because uh, a couple of number of things have, flow, have, have, have come from that. When you've got now 1.4 billion people, you better give them work. They're now locked in to having to manufacture massive, massive volumes of things, which means they're locked into selling them. So they're absolutely, because they cannot afford mass unemployment. So in, in all sorts of ways, flowing from the, you know, the geography of the past, it's still there. They, they are locked in uh, to that. Now, the ideology, um, I mean, they're not communists, let's face it. They are dictators using a, a system in order to control a large amount of people. Now, I think it helps them that it actually fits other systems of thought, not just communism, that the great masses do need to be controlled for the greater good. Yeah, I mean, there is a bit of bleeding over into Confucius and the Chinese do look at the world in a different way. In, and I, I remember having to um, uh, read, I, got, I was hectored once by the Chinese ambassador in London. <laughs> And I was quite humbled in a way from her perspective, her saying to me, look, you, you're just looking at things from this individual way. We've got 1.4 billion people to take care of. You know, do you think we can afford your, your, your lackadaisical in, in, individual way of looking at the world? No, we can't. And I, I thought she had a point. I mean, I, I stick with the individual's rights first and foremost as the best way to govern even large societies. But I do understand, but they are locked in. They're locked in, double cropping, massive population, having to build, it's, it's, it's priced in. Thank you. So there are actually quite a few questions uh, on the PRC. And I want to fold one in now from Sir Andrew Cook, uh, who's a leading um, UK manufacturer. Um, and his question is, um, is war with China inevitable? And if not, and, and you seem to be suggesting it wasn't, um, but if not, how can it be averted without uh, the West um, simply giving the PRC everything it wants? Um, because it, it can give the PRC some of what it wants. Um, it, uh, under, under Trump, you didn't hear anything about the Uyghurs. Uh, under Biden, we will. He came to power promising uh, to talk about human rights, and, and he will. But in the long term, will they? And how much does that matter? So they, that can be given. I'm not making an argument for this, uh, Professor. I, I really must hasten to add that. Um, secondly, uh, other things can be given, which is uh, backing off a little bit. But they can only back off so far. Um, if they back off too much, they will only have one half of the Pacific and they cannot back off from the sea lanes. But on trade, they can back off uh, 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 and they can come to an agreement over various issues. Now, the reason I don't think they are going to back off is that I don't think China will reach military parity with the United States for at least three decades. And I don't think it's inevitable that they will. And I don't think it's inevitable, even if they were, that they would win a war. Um, but there's a lot of ifs coming up here. 
um, which, which, which are inevitable. Let's take Taiwan. Firstly, the Chinese have never done an amphibious assault. And this would be the biggest amphibious, so this would be worse than D-Day. And it's 200 miles across the strait. They don't have enough ships for an amphibious assault, but they are building them. They have no experience of amphibious assault. It's 200 miles. You would be bombed before you set out. You'd be bombed along the way and you'd be bombed when you got there. That's without the Americans. If the Americans join in and they say they will, it's po quite possible, probable, the Australians would join them. The Japanese are actually as strong militarily at the moment as the Chinese are. They might be roped in. And there are other countries that don't like China, Philippines, Vietnam to an extent, they fought a war with them in the 70s. So is China really gonna risk that? Is it really gonna go hell for leather? Not for the foreseeable future, it's not, not for years and years to come. That's one if, another one, supposing they implode. China implodes periodically, I'm not saying it will do, but it has done, it might do again. It might go back to its regional factionalism. Uh, it, they might have mass unemployment and the system might be overthrown. These are big ifs. So I don't think it's inevitable. A, because there's some cooperation that can be done and B, because why would China risk that? Why would China risk everything it's got? Um, at the moment, it's trying to build its Belt and Road Initiative through the Central Asian republics. That might not go that well. No, I, I don't think it's inevitable. And also missing from it, is the ide ideology. You know, the, the, the Americans do not need to contain Chinese communism all around the world uh, and push back wherever it pops up as, as they felt they had to with Russian communism. Thank you. So there have been also a number of questions on climate change. Um, and uh, one here from uh, Robert Wallace, who's a journalist, um, and he's pushing back a bit uh, on uh, the, the sort of optimism around space and wondering whether um, the climate change is not a ticking bomb, uh, which will explode uh, long before we can realize uh, the potentialities there. Um, and he wonders how you respond to that. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't blame pushing back at all. Um, there are many, many problems about going to space. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the, the satellite belt and if there was one dominant power, and if they had a war there, well, there is mutually assured destruction. You know, this is now the 21st century's version of it, if you like. I mean, we still have the original. But yeah, a war in space uh, would, uh, unless it was a very limited one, I mean, I wish we had more time. If there was a proper war in space, the debris would smash into all the satellites that I mentioned and the whole world economy would go kaput. So why would you want to do that? It is mutually assured destruction. That doesn't mean there can't be a very limited war. And there's also the problem about blinding your enemy's movement on the ground. They might think you're about to launch a nuclear bomb. I mean, yeah, this is very, very dangerous stuff. And you probably know that possibly behind your, your question. But, there, but just as we haven't had nuclear war here, we don't have to have an all-out war in space, but that doesn't mean there won't be. Some and the Russians tested a killer satellite last year, which they weren't supposed to have done. So yeah, I'm, I'm aware of those dangers. Um, but but on the positive side, uh, there's possibly water on the moon. There is technology already being developed to develop the um, um, uh, the solar panels in space, which deflect the sunlight. They can go straight down to developing countries, free electricity. That that people aren't even necessarily going to compete for. That would be a, a bit of a game changer. Um, as I said, there's the rare earth minerals and many others. And that asteroid I mentioned is just one. And there are hundreds of them that we know of. You don't need to rip it out of the earth and compete on the earth like we are doing in Africa at the moment. So that's another positive. And then in, in the round, in the broadest sense, I mean, this isn't space travel, this is just AI. But AI may well come up with nuclear fusion. AI may well come up with desalinating vast bits of water, quantities of water at, at, for virtually free, also reducing tensions between places like India and Pakistan, um, doing away with the concept of water wars. You know, th there's a lot of reasons to be cheerful. There's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. We've, we've always overcome problems uh, more now than we ever have done, despite of course, in large parts of the world, being a veil of tears. Thank you. Now, there have been a number of questions pertaining to areas that you weren't able to cover 
um, in, in, the, in your opening remarks, but I know are actually covered in, in the book. Um, one of them is the Western Balkans, and we have a question uh, from Katerina from uh, Macedonia, um, who would like to know uh, how you see the geopolitical importance of the Western Balkans, which has been uh, obviously quite, quite important uh, since the 1990s. Um, how you see that developing? Yeah, oh, I, I also should say, <coughs> excuse me, to the people that have asked the questions before, I, I am aware that, you know, I have the privilege of being able to answer your question at length and any of the gaps in my argument, you're not able to push back and apologies for that. Uh, of course, of course the, I mean, everywhere is strategically important and the Western Balkans uh, is as well. Um, I don't think we went uh, to war there uh, in the 90s for really st strategic reasons. I genuinely think the humanitarian impetus, uh, which was quite fashionable then, uh, was the main reason. I, I never bought this pipeline stuff. But absolutely, there is, uh, there was, and there still is, the um, West Russia, European Russia element of it. And there's a bit of China now, uh, uh, as well. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's why NATO is looking favorably down there, as is the EU. And COVID, the EU's played a very bad hand in the Balkans. So when you look at Serbia, Kosovo, uh, uh, Republika Srpska in, in, in um, part of Bosnia, we know the Russians are playing very heavily there. We know that they are sending weapons that they shouldn't be to the police force in Republika Srpska, the sort of heavy weapons that you're not supposed to have under the Dayton Agreement. Um, and it's a de facto, you know, small military. And there's a reason for that. And it's that Russia uh, decided in 1999, this far and no further, that was the high tide or the low tide for them. And they've been pushing back ever since, and they still are. So the Russians want more access into the Western Balkans. Uh, they also don't want it joining the EU, so they're trying to prize um, countries away, notably Serbia. And then, of course, China um, it, it also wants in. Now, China is blocked from getting into the EU countries. In a way, it's not blocked. Uh, and they would love to peel these countries away as well, get them into the Belt and Road, get them to be um, economically beneficial. And again, you, you can't blame the Chinese, um, but they're going in hook lines uh, all the way to try to get this foothold on the peripher periphery um, of the European Union to make sure it, the European Union doesn't get any stronger. Same, same for, the, for the Russians. And the EU, because it's gone through this traumas of the past few years, hasn't been paying that much attention. It keeps taking its eye off the ball of the Balkans. You know, we all, everybody, all the nations did it in the uh, 90s, and then they did it again after the Balkan Wars, before the next one came in, in 99. Um, and COVID, the Chinese, as you probably know, went straight into Serbia and said, would you like our vaccine? Because the EU was very busy saying, we haven't got any for you. I mean, it, was, it was brilliant. And the Serbian president ended up kissing the uh, Chinese flag when the first... And, and the Russians came in with Sputnik as, as, as well. The EU has played a terrible hand when it comes to the COVID vaccination. And the Russians and the Chinese have, uh, have, have taken advantage and will continue to try to do so. Now, another area that um, uh, is in the book, um, because you cover the Sahel, for example, um, that was in the presentations Africa. Um, and uh, we've been picked up on this by um, Edgar Barroso from Mozambique. So he'd like you to address the question of uh, the geopolitical uh, importance of Africa, and perhaps, uh, and this will be from me, um, whether you see now uh, this uh, map of conflict between the PRC and the West, whether you see that also being played out in Africa. I think in Africa, it's much more economic. Um, um, I mean, the Chinese, I think they've got a base in Djibouti uh, from memory, I think so. Uh, and uh, as you'll know, coming from Mozambique, the Chinese are also, they, they put in the security guards to guard all the camps because they're bringing their workers in as well because it's a way of alleviating unemployment. I mean, it obviously doesn't go down very well amongst the local people in the places they go to. But these security guards are not security guards. They are, they are policemen. 
They're police officers of the PRC, they're very well trained. So there's a sort of quasi-military down there already, but um, they have no real military capabilities, um, nor I, do I think are they really going to build many. I mean, Djibouti is a nice foothold in the Red Sea, but that's more for the strategic uh, Red Sea choke point. So I think it's more economic, uh, and they're doing very well on that. They, they do not tie their uh, deals to good governance the way that some of the Western nations do. I mean, you could argue that's a form of neocolonialism, uh, saying we'll only do this if you do that. On the other hand, you could argue that it's they're trying to you know, safeguard people's livelihoods with good governance. Chinese don't bother with all that, so they have a, an economic advantage, and I think they're going to do very, very nicely. Uh, just look at Angola, for example. Um, further, further up, um, the Sahel, uh, th th this, is, this is connected because the Chinese and Russians are also playing there and actually helping uh, to try to stabilize the situation up to a point. But when it comes to the Sahel, um, the, you know, you'll know the five main Sahel countries um, have invited the outside world to come and try and help them because there is a genuine possibility of at least one of them becoming a failed state. Um, you probably saw what happened in Chad last week when the president was killed. Um, the French have got 6,000 troops fighting there, and I don't think very many people are aware of that outside of Africa. I don't think the Europeans are aware of it. French are. And the British have got 250 troops fighting down there, the Light Dragoons. And I, 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 I'm absolutely certain that hardly anyone in this country knows that the UK is militarily engaged, quite reasonably heavily. We've got some helicopters down there as well. Um, and why? Um, it is to try to stabilize the country. It is because they've been asked to come, but it's also because if they are failed states, i refer you back to that video we showed, then that movement of peoples will uh, intensify into North Africa, not the most stable part of the world, and then on into Europe. Now we've seen in Europe the effect on our politics of this movement of peoples, and it hasn't been pretty. It is partially fueled the rise of populism and, and, and uh, the unpleasant sides of nationalism, and that would get worse. So it is in both our interests as well as being humanitarian to try and uh, stabilize that part of the world. I'm afraid it's spreading. ISIS and AQ are playing down there, and it's, it's even spreading now into places like the Ivory Coast. It could even get into Ghana, Gambia, places like that, Senegal, I'm afraid. Um, across the other side, um, Ethiopia is playing a very, very um, clever game of not taking sides, mostly. Um, and it is trying to be friends with everybody. And it is seeking to mostly try and stabilize the, the Horn of Africa. Um, I mean, Africa, there's some amazing things going on and some amazing modern technologies and vibrancy. But the figures still show that also huge swathes of it remain immersed in poverty. You'll know the population growth is predicted within about 40 years to double from 1.2 billion to 2.4 billion if you can't create the jobs for this extra billion people. Where are they going to go? So, Tim, I feel that I'm, I'm dragging you all across the globe um, and I'm going to pull you in yet another direction because we have a question here from Mohsen Amiri from Iran. Um, and he says, having heard what you say about uh, the, the very long geopolitical confrontation uh, between Iran and its Western neighbors, what are the chances for saving the JCPOA in the near future? <clears throat> I remember writing last year that yeah. um, for the Americans to get back into it, uh, it's a big ask. It's, it's going to be so difficult. Not because necessarily it's a bad idea or a good idea, but because of the politics inside the two countries. I mean, you'll know the Americans are obsessed with Iran. Um, Congress is on the warpath. And for Biden to get the Americans back in, um, Iran's got to give quite a lot. And that's the internal politics of, of your country, of course. The hardliners are, are in charge again, pretty much. I would argue they always have been. Um, and they're saying, no, why should we give an inch? And so, so, I mean, I know they're talking and they've got the Vienna talks, but, but to reach agreement 
what is required on both sides uh, may prove too much. Now it's doable and it, it could be done by as early as the end of this year, possibly, but you've probably seen that the IAEA, Atomic uh, Energy Agency, uh, is about, or has done today, I'm afraid I haven't caught the news today, but I know it was about to say Iran is completely not cooperating with the uh, UN Security Council and that, um, well, sorry, I need to hedge all that. They're not, they haven't said it today, but behind the scenes, the IA is preparing reports that they're not complying fully. And the, the, uh, the Iranians are playing fairly hard. So um, what flows from that, if it doesn't happen, is, is um, I'm afraid the sanctions stay. And if the sanctions stay, the economy stays where it is. And all the tension stays, both on the domestic front. Um, so I, I, I really want to underline that stuff about the IEA, because um, as I said, I think they're just preparing some reports for the future. But it is my information that they are going to be arguing at some point that Iran is not, is not complying. And you, and you could argue, why should they? Uh, the Americans broke it. The Iranians are now spinning the centrifuges uh, ever, ever faster. And we saw what happened with um, that um, explosion uh, last, last month, last week. You know, I'm afraid it's, it's, it's where it was. It hasn't advanced yet. They're working on it. I'm skeptical. So I'm afraid we're beginning to run out of time. But uh, I have uh, one more question um, of my own, because I think it'd be remiss uh, not to ask about the really interesting chapter you have on the British Isles, um, or at least on the United Kingdom, which you look at as a geopolitical unit. And, and in fact, you quote Mackinder there as well, uh, where you, he says, great consequences lie in the simple statements that Britain is an island group set in an ocean, but off the shores of a great continent. Um, and so within the space of two minutes, uh, I'd like you to address though the fact that of course there are, have been very different outcomes uh, politically and geopolitically from that uh, unchanging um, geographical situation. Okay. So being part okay. of the EU, Brexit, uh, United Kingdom, Irish independence. Uh, so in, in two minutes, Tim. <laughs> Got to stop watching. Here we go. One, Mackinder's indented ports equals, um, indented coastline equals really good ports, often deep water ports. Deep water ports mean you can build big ships and go out into the world. Being in the great ocean uh, sh shipping lines without anyone trying to stop us. Um, secondly, what have we got to build those ships? Fantastic wood, oak trees. That's what started it. Secondly, when we switched to coal power, got loads of that straight out on these great from these great ports with these great ships. Now powered by coal. Now powered by nuclear. Um, Britain is in a fantastic geopolitical position, looking straight across at the biggest, richest market in the world. If it gets its politics right, and I'm not making a case for or against Brexit, I'm saying if it gets its politics right, it's in a fantastic location, sea lanes, market. One cloud on the horizon, if, and it's a big if, there is Scottish independence, and Scotland goes, the British nuclear deterrent, where will it park its four submarines? They're up there in the cloud, Clyde, where there's a great cloud cover and a very nice port. There's nowhere else in the rump UK that would be, that could take them. So the strategic blow to the UK of Scottish independence would be um, quite significant. That's the negative, uh, potentially or positive, if you look at it a different way. Um, I'm optimistic. I'm not making a case for or against Brexit. I'm just saying the sky hasn't fallen. Let's get on with it. Well, that seems a very suitable note uh, on which to end, and I'm afraid that is all we have time for this evening. There have been lots of questions. I haven't been able to, to pose all of them, and indeed not all of, all of my own. Um, but I would like to thank Tim Marshall very much indeed uh, for his excellent lecture, and you, the audience, also for your questions. If you enjoyed this discussion, please do follow us on Twitter at CAM Geopolitics and check back on our website to stay updated with our work. The video recording for this event will be uploaded to www.cfgpolis.can.ac.uk shortly. The Centre has also just launched a new podcast, Cambridge Geopolitics Conversations. Episodes can be found on our website or wherever you usually get your podcasts or on YouTube.
goodbye.